I hate Black Clover with a fiery passion. There's never been a show that made me not angry, sad with how bad it is, and believe it or not, it has nothing to do with Asta speaking in caps lock, a rocky start, or 50 shades of everyone's face. I'm talking about the fundamental systems, stolen ideas, entire scene sequences that can be thrown away without affecting the result. Hell, go see the number one reason why before you click off, I'll even give you the timestamps to make it easy. Hello Kamrad, my name is Machis. Come, get yourself a beverage and sit down with me. We got a long-awaited explanation in coming. Let me set the stage and tell you about my experience with this show. First time I watched it, I barely made it to episode 6 and stopped there. But then I thought to myself, it's a shonen, a big shonen, and I gave Black Clover a very fair second chance. 50 episodes, that's 5 arcs, which is about 13 hours if you trim all the opening slash recaps. And in case you were thinking, I just skimmed through it, no, I was paying attention and tried to get invested into the story, the world, the characters. I did to a degree. Yeah, Asta was annoying, but he is good people. Sure, the plot is a bit generic, but he is good people. The magic system seems a bit cheesy, but you guessed it, it's still good people. However, very quickly, I've noticed that I'm being lied to. Something doesn't quite compute here. Take Luck, for example. He was introduced as this energetic dude, always ready to throw down, who had the nickname Smiling Battle Maniac for reasons of loving to go solo and winning fights. Well, about that, not only did he flop the very first battle we saw him in, he hasn't done anything significant in the next several fights, with the exception of one fish priest who he defeated off fucking screen. Come on, man. If you hype up a character like that, the least you can do is show a decisive W for once. Against Lotus, Asta did all the heavy lifting. The other priest was given a dose of despair, and the grumpy orange Hank himself suffered no damage at all from Lux and Magna's duel. Where is this smiling battle maniac I heard so much about? In approximately the same area as a bunch of scenes that are redundant or have no impact whatsoever. We all know of the legend of the first Wizard King. That's fine, what if we imbeciles forget about that irrelevant piece of lore and can't put it together when something new is revealed? I mean, two things. Constant reinforcement of character archetypes or plot points in entire sequences that mean nothing. I hate when I'm treated like a four-year-old who has to be reminded that Noelle is royalty every other sentence she speaks, that RMC wants to marry Sister Lily, or that you all need some despair, hate, whatever in your life. Seriously, if I was to take a half shot every time I hear a character mentioning their gimmick, I'd be fucking dead and that's coming from a Russian. No one in the target audience, 10 plus usually, needs to be reminded this much as it flattens the character to the point where they just associate with one single word and seem to have nothing else going on. Same thing with a lot of scenes in this show where people either do nothing and watch things happen or their actions have no impact on the outcome of the situation. Let's look at the despair guy since I've mentioned him. Who won that fight? Black Bulls obviously, but who really contributed to Veto's defeat? Here's the breakdown of the fight. Mr. Smiles engages Luck and Magna. They pretend to have a main character moment, but fail miserably, after which Asta comes in to save the day as usual. Backed by his new dancing buddy, they try to show the villain some moves, only to be dicked on to and needing to be saved by another duo, Kanoha, uh, sorry, Kahano and Noel. You'd think that something will change, but no, their cheeks are clapped just as hard, if not harder than the others. Granted, Her Royal Majesty also attempted the Fable main character moment and at least got this boss to its second phase, so props to her I guess. Next, Asta realizes that too many people have tried to claim his role in the show and jumps in to protect his teammate moments after laying motionless on the floor. He delivers a motivational speech inspiring his allies, so another duo jumps into the fray. Blah blah blah, three more people, they distract, the show remembers that Asta is wielding a fucking sword, not a club, and with a bit of early celebration, a true main character has a moment, followed by Veto's quick defeat. But it's not over, since he's about to yell Licht is great and turn the seabed temple into just seabed. So Yami, who was previously stuck with no way out, pushes past his limits and saves the day, this time for good. What the fuck? You mean to tell me that he had it in him this whole time? This show just basically took all the stakes it had set up and threw them out the window, upsetting not only Guga, but me too. Okay, okay. In order to go plus ultra, you're required to feel some type of way. So, they all needed to lose in order for the captain to go beyond. 
Yet that would have been the same if they all just dropped without all this extracurricular action. If I somehow, going through some mental gymnastics that would make Inosuke proud, can't justify everyone's involvement, Lux and Magna's section, which is about 13 minutes of screen time, can be just cut from the show without any losses at all. It won't affect the fight whatsoever. Maybe that was the point, to show that this is indeed a mighty foe that will push our squad to the limit, but we already know that. This guy was posing a challenge even for captains in the last arc, so all it did was further prove that these two aren't shit in the grand scheme of things and that the victory is achieved by some ass pull bullshit. Yes, the whole power system is built on plot convenient power-ups, and the main reason for why I dislike it, it invalidates hard work and training as a whole. You can say, Mahis, you dimwit, if Noelle didn't practice her waterbending, she would have never unlocked this spell in her book. Let me draw a parallel that even people from Freedom Land can understand. If you're experienced with AR-15 and suddenly need to go against an armored target, AP rounds don't magically appear in your magazine regardless of how dire the situation is. You need to bring them to use them. And what characters in Black Clover do is carry a bunch of locked spells in their grimoire that need to be purchased with their desire to persevere when the plot demands it like a bunch of DLCs. Which, on the side note, is even worse, because if you roll the grimoire with only one page, no amount of character development will help you. Look at some other shonens. Sure, they do have moments like that, because it's cool for fuck's sake. But Naruto had to grind like a motherfucker to get Rasengan and to upgrade it into Razen Shuriken. Not only did it not work the first time, he had to spend even more time making it safe to use. Here, some ungodly time-stopping power, perfect for the occasion, the user and the exact location of the event, yeah, no problem, not even a downside to it. How am I supposed to feel any danger for our squad if at any point somebody can discover a spell that will save the day? Yami, my favorite character in the show, was quite unsure of how to deal with Patoli's AoE attack just a dozen episodes ago, and now he can suddenly slash dimensions in half several times in a row with very little effort. There is simply no satisfaction here, and it's only half the problem, because to my knowledge, Asta hasn't lost a single fight. Like, legit. Every time there is some assistance pushing past his limits or flat-out divine intervention. Think about it. This newbie schmuck, who just joined the ranks and went on a single quest, who is wielding some weird sword that goes bonk and who has no experience nor knowledge about how to traverse hostile magical terrain, is sent to investigate a new dungeon on the border of an enemy kingdom. I'm sure Julius knows what he is doing, but on top of all this, Asta was the literal key to the magic door that held a huge upgrade for Yuno and the second out of three anti-magic swords that was located behind a damn wall. Again, I have nothing against the at the right place at the right time trope, since it's a good way to set up interesting plot points and character progression. But when the whole show is based on that, it defeats the purpose of said progression. How would you feel if Ichigo just randomly popped his Bankai in the middle of the battle without any prior training? Everybody would have lost their mind, cause even the 3 day express course was already pushing the ass pool boundaries. Give me something specific to look for, so there can be a satisfying payoff when it happens. Look at what Demon Slayer did recently. Tanjiro was in a pinch, couldn't perform his usual routine and decided to give Thunder Breathing a shot. It's a totally awesome concept, where you can think of it as a natural progression of Slayer's training. Master one style, then Uncle Iroh the rest. Yet, with no prior build-up or any indication that it's something commonly done, it came out as another Tanjiro Mary Sue moment and viewers were rightfully pissed about it. Speaking of Mary Sue, I've already mentioned Asta not losing a single fight, but did you notice that he is literally a plug for every hole? Anywhere he goes, he's a perfect solution for whatever problem. Granted, his power is quite unique, and in the world where everything is magical in some capacity, it makes sense that an ability to cancel it would be rather useful. However, do we really need him to have an answer for every single struggle? He stopped Noel's attempt to flood the area, avenged Magna's friend, did all the dungeon things we discussed, bonked the memory-altering magic out of the captives, did the same to the poor kids, accidentally unsealed Patoli's magic stash, penetrated the water barrier… The list goes on, and it seems like the only people who ever do something important are Asta, Yuno and those captain level or above. What's the point of developing all these characters? Quite decently, I may add. So that they help during some encounters? I always felt like none of the good guys are moving the plot forward, except for the MC, of course. 
yet. At the same time, nobody is acknowledging how abnormal this guy is, not trying to investigate his abilities. Dude has a 5 leaf clover grimoire, something has never happened for what these people understand and he wields anti-magic while being magicless himself. What the fuck are you all doing? There is a literal miracle walking around and not even the dude who examined his floating book does anything about it. Oh, I don't know, let people in the capital look at it. Are you shitting me? That's akin to Einstein holding an antimatter container and passing it to someone else because he has no idea what it is. It won't happen. Every scholar worth their salt would line up just to get a chance to see a five-leaf clover. How come Sally is the only one to do so? Sure, maybe they don't see the clover itself because it's so dirty, but anti-magic? In a world where everything is all about magic, you definitely want to investigate such a phenomenon. Oh, and about that, we see people using mana left, right and center, but as soon as something happens, only the magic knights are taking part in the action. Where are the regular guards with at least a fireball or something? Oi, you mean to tell me that if you can light up a stove, you can't do that to a zombie? Seriously, during the assault of the royal capital, the city where magic is everything, people weren't even trying to use magic when shit hit the fan. I'm not expecting them to solo all the villains, but if some peasant kids can do this, the adults should be able to at least slow down, barricade or otherwise impair these shambling sacks of necromancy. Does the show forget its own rules? The same fairy tale, everyone is able to use magic. Piss off enough people and the sheer quantity of spells you'll have to deal with will be quite troublesome. And don't give me this crap about they're scared, they're not prepared and so on. These are superhumans who have tools at the tip of their fingers that we can only dream of, which they have used their entire life. So, instead of fight or flight response, they will have magic fight or magic flight. Which is rather interesting because I don't see anyone using magic to escape either. Again, something just does not add up. Now, it's time to quickly mention the production value of the anime. Manga is fine, I've read it a bit and this section barely applies to it. Nevertheless, visuals are an essential part of viewing experience and we can't completely ignore them. In the beginning, I've said that I will not talk about characters sometimes being drawn like they belong in Mob Psycho, so I won't. Instead, we shall tackle this show's animation as a whole. It's a clusterfuck. I'm sorry if you're saying that this anime is drawn well, you need to check your eyes, I'm seriously concerned about their health. Because it's borderline impressive how inconsistent and ugly this show looks. And don't you put your hands on the keyboard yet, since you probably don't realize one thing. Black Clover is one of the most expensive animes on the planet, with the lowest cost per episode I can find being $100,000 and the average cost looking to be about 140 k This over here was made with an average budget, which is about 80 grand an episode. I understand that these numbers don't represent the whole picture, there are many other things that go into making an anime, staffing, script writing, voice acting, etc, etc. But, as much as I don't want to say it, in this particular case, it feels like whoever animated all this had no love for the show at all. I'm partially correct, since it seems like they had great troubles with lack of staff and had to outsource a bunch of their work. Still, I can't believe this is the same studio that gave us OG Naruto, Shippuden, Bleach, you'd think that they know a thing or two about making a shonen. Let's look at some examples, Patoli vs Yami. The first half of their battle was a slow-paced slideshow of gifts in comparison to the next episode, which brought a bunch of dynamic movement, nice camera work and frames. See for yourself. If episode 35 looks like it has been produced by an experienced anime studio, episode 34 next to it looks like it was made by a single student in between classes using some trial version of the editing app. Because what in the name of Adobe After Effects is this? 
I know it's a different episode, but I swear I've seen these exact particles in Mortal Kombat 1995. Then there are plain animation errors that shouldn't get past quality control, like with Ast over here. Or Magnus glasses in this case. I haven't edited it. There are timestamps of these exact moments, you're welcome to check. It's simply disrespectful towards the audience. Can you imagine my hero Akka, Demon Slayer or Jujutsu Kaisen fucking up like that? Well, you don't have to, because there is a recent precedent with MAPPA and JJK specifically. I won't go into details, as even though my heart does go out to their employees, this topic is outside my area of expertise, so let me focus on what is. Animation. Obviously there is a difference, it looks raw and less polished, but the art style is consistent, emotions are properly displayed and the action is still bombastic. If anything, I got a bit of a One Piece vibe with all these free-flowing lines giving the show a more artsy look. Although, I got to admit I do see a lot of cutting corners in the form of static images, almost sketch-like sequences and aspect ratio changes, which is actually a smart move that does save some effort and surprisingly makes these moments appear very cinematic. It's clear that there was a struggle during the production process. However, the love, the sweat, the tears are still present and as a result, it's beautiful because the core of the animation is. Black Clover, on the other hand, it doesn't have one. It's a constant fluctuation of quality, style, questionable design choices. Like, why is there a pixelated wave of shit in the middle of a fight? It doesn't match the color scheme of anything else and is completely out of place. Then there is 3D that looks worse than the Dark Young, movement with no force behind it, along with frequent recycling of shots, which should never happen. Another thing that should never happen is stealing ideas, aka plagiarizing. I've completed a university program and I'm well aware of what paraphrasing plagiarism is. It's when you use someone else's writing with some minor changes and present it as your own. Yeah, you can sue Black Clover over it, but you also can't deny that it took excessive inspiration from other shonen. For example, the first episode is Naruto in a nutshell. Everyone passes the selection process, MC doesn't, so he has to go through some shenanigans with a bad guy to unlock the whatever ability he will use every chance he gets, while saving an important person in the process who says that they've always believed in our boy. Out of all the shonen I can think of, these are the only two first episodes that share so many similarities. And if you're saying, well, it's an homage, these stories go in totally separate directions, maybe later. Because Asta's first mission happens in a village held hostage by a bad guy who killed the hero of said village, there is a bridge, there is mist, there are ice users, and there is even a grave overlooking the area at the very end. You can't make this shit up. Well, one show did and the other Sharingan did. But wait, there is more. Let me introduce you to Gaara of the Ice, an emotionless war machine from another country who was bred to be an ultimate weapon from birth, who killed a person they held dear, who can use his abilities while standing still, who can pilot an elemental mecha, who has a change of heart after the defeat and who makes people around them surprised that they can say thank you. Are you for real? Ain't nothing wrong with taking an idea, giving it an interesting spin and putting it in your story. Jujutsu Kaisen does that occasionally with, let's say, their version of Ido Tensei. Both spells require a piece of whoever you resurrect, both take over a life human and both carry certain risks like a person overpowering the Jutsu. They even did the same find inner peace and fuck off back to afterlife type thing. Sure, it's not a completely original idea, but it's implemented in a creative way with the little spin I was mentioning. That's the Black Clover's problem. They blatantly take ideas from other shows and don't improve them whatsoever. Black Bulls HQ is practically fairy tale guild. Black Market is a less protected Diagon Alley. Combo Attack is literally a unison raid, it even looks the same. Then there is the cast. Main duo is a blend of many cliches, but they remind me of Hinata and Kageyama. Followed by, in no particular order, Kana Alberona, Hinata Senju, Tsundere Ida, Byaku and Hitsugai's love child, Ban and Miliode's love child, typical high school delinquent, Marilyn fucking Manson, Tinker Bell, Nun from the Rip of Church, Kenpachi on Weed, Hanji on Crack, Zeno on Ecstasy, Ulkiora on Meth, Clover on Ghoul, Necromancer Neitora, Naruto the Wizard King, another totally competent king, 100% bad guy, 80% bad guy. 
<laughs> all right, I agree, I got carried away there, but that's all to cope with the situation since we're about to get what frustrates me the most about this anime and why I even made this pitch, which is turning out to be one of my longest videos to date. The number one reason that causes depletion of all serotonin, norepinephrine and dopamine in my nervous system is that this show can be fucking good. You've heard that right. This piece of crap has everything to be a good shonen and they even showed it to me, but then they spat in my face by diminishing the entire thing to an annoying amalgamation of tropes, borrowed ideas, cheesy systems, none of which bring anything new to the table, nor do they execute any of them well. Not to mention the most abhorrent animation I've seen in all my 20 years of watching anime. You can't show me a cool magical world, ambitious underdog, instant rivalry setup, fantastic soundtrack, epic power-up, good fucking animation in the first episode, and then make me watch this? Let me tell you what's so good about this story, starting with harsh topics that it covers. Immediately we get racism, classism, and other forms of discrimination based solely on what people can't really control. Magic. What was given to you, you'll have to deal with and you'll be judged along the way. Even if you get the best shit, you won't be praised by everyone. You'll be pressed because others don't like it when their position of power or authority is threatened by an up-and-coming prodigy. As a result of that, there is a huge disparity in the society. Those who have great magic look down on those who don't. And RMC being completely magicless presents another level of challenge that most other stories simply don't have. Yusuke, Ichigo, Luffy, even Deku all get that magical attribute, while Asta doubles down on his magiclessness and gets a tool to bring others to his level. This is an incredible setup and a way more compelling argument for being feared, hated, discriminated against than that of Naruto, for example. After all, nobody knows how this is possible, or those who do know that it comes from devils. Either way, it's not a good look and should be treated accordingly by everyone around him. By the way, who do we have around them? More beautiful gems. Yuno might not have the story as elaborate as Sasuke's, but he's a far better rival to the MC because of their previous connection, their dichotomy and generally warm feelings towards each other. Yes, they get into some sibling type fights, still, they care about one another and want both of them to succeed. Next we have Noelle, a great addition to the team for reasons I've mentioned before. She is a royalty and comes with an appropriate package. She will have to perform a lot of self-improvement, not only to deal with her trauma, but to become a better person as a whole. I really liked the direction she went during their first assignment. Royalty is given all this mana to safeguard people, not to bring them further down. Then there is Yami who is just awesome in almost every department, black bulls with their own struggles who welcome and support their newbies regardless, followed by stark contrast with Golden Dawn where Yuno has to fight tooth and nail to get even a modicum of recognition. As for the grand plot, there is the conflict with the elves, devils, humans, other kingdoms, it's all very interesting to read about in forms of articles, but to actually watch it, I can't. My expectations just don't align with what I'm given at all. I've brought up many examples, a few more won't hurt. Yami and Asta's dialogue after Veto's defeat, which put a final nail in the coffin of my desire to continue watching. Our main character expresses sympathy and attempts to understand his enemy, while the captain, instead of contributing to his development and turning it into a mentorship moment, just laughs it off and tells Asta not to think too much about it. What? We just got a bunch of hints that these guys might not be some one-dimensional villains we thought they were and you so casually shut it down? The potential at that moment was so great, yet you gave it the most generic don't worry follow your dreams spin and turned it into some pathetic joke. Oh Asta's hands are fucked up, he can't remove his blindfold, lol. I was so pissed that I almost didn't notice this moment, Kahuno's song. That was so good it made me sad, because the show clearly has the ability to make something beautiful, but it just doesn't. They keep giving me mediocre crap with simple dialogue and even simpler animation. Another plot development that infuriated me was what they did with Fugolion. This was one of the few fucking nobles who had something resembling a head on his shoulders and who gave good advice to both Asta and Noel. What do they do to him? Remove him from the show for a good while, who the fuck needs him? It could have been Dickface who lost his arm, the plot would have been mostly unaffected and we would have had one more decent character in this bitch. 
because he was the only person who gave this whole royalty some depth and served as a great tool to explore social issues highlighted in the show. Julius kinda does that, but he's the Wizard King. His situation is a bit different and doesn't suit this role as much. Lastly, I want to mention one more bane of my existence. Fake out death. I already dislike when characters survive the most bullshit situations, and when you make it seem that they won't survive while they still do, it makes my blood boil and I'm glad I never got this far. Also, don't even get me started on resurrecting people. Kabuto didn't bring as many back in Naruto as the elves did here. After listening to all this, you must be asking yourself a very reasonable question. Why would you watch 50 episodes of the show you claim to hate and then proceed to make this long ass video? The short answer, I wanted to know what's up because I kept hearing so many good things about Black Clover. My first attempt at watching was out of pure curiosity, I didn't like it and stopped, nothing else to it. But on my second watch, I was determined to figure out what's going on. I just couldn't believe that this show is being praised so much when stuff like uh, my hero Aka gets a bunch of hate. Oh, it's generic, follows a lot of tropes. Have you seen Black Clover? It not only follows, it blatantly copies them. Oh, half the class say yet no development. Sure, but it's compensated by one of the best villain evolutions in recent years. I agree that Lich's story is cool, though we've seen all that in Naruto and to an extent in Bleach. Fuck, even Fairy Tale. As for Shigaraki, I can't think of another villain who went through as much progress as him. Ghetto is a contender, except he was more of a hero who lived long enough to become a villain. By the way, the reason I drew comparison with my hero is because they came out about the same time, not because I used the story of Midoriya as some frame of reference. If you watched any of my critique videos, you'd know that I try to stay objective, compare things to other shows and support my arguments with examples. I needed to watch the show, at least give it a fair try, so I can create an adequate picture in my mind and be ready to defend my opinion. Yes, my standards are high, though I do watch Demon Slayer and it doesn't make me feel sad. Uh, yeah, a little upset at times cause fuck season 3. Still, my goal, always, is to understand the subject and express my own unbiased opinion while providing constructive arguments. It was I, Mahis, letting it all out into the microphone. Have a great whatever time of the day you have. Until next time, cheers. Look at what Demon Slayer did re Look at what Dim Look at what Demon Slayer did recently. Блять, почему я буквы местами путаю, блять?